Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to day one of the Stex 25 showcase. Today we're going to have eight companies from the realms of robotics, IoT, advanced manufacturing, and AI. I'm very pleased to announce that we have over 750 attendees. And when I looked over the weekend, that number, there were actually representatives from uh, 150 multinational corporations and um, from 36 different countries. So this number has gone up over the last two days by 200. STEX 25 is our accelerator program. It's a 12 month program that features 25 of the most prominent MIT startups. Um, sorry. And I want to spend a moment um, detailing the quality of this group of companies. We have eight of them with us today. Over the last um, three and a half years, we've had 74 uh, startups be part of Stex 25. And when we looked at the composition of their founding teams, we found that 46% have at least one MIT faculty, 55% have at least one MIT PhD, 61% one MIT masters or more, and 31% MIT um, bachelors. So the founding team of these uh, startups is um, arguably world-class. They have um, enormous technical expertise. Another interesting component of the, uh, the startups is that 43% have founders from more than one MIT department or school. And this is very typical MIT, sort of the cross-pollination of disciplines to create superior solutions. Together, they've raised over 2.2 billion in capital. And we know there's a number of unicorns in this group, as well as there have been a number of acquisitions. The agenda for today is as follows. We're gonna start with some lightning talks. Each startup is gonna present for four minutes. There's gonna be about two minutes of Q&A. The first batch is gonna include Akasha Imaging, Prescient Devices, Light Intelligence, and Lumi. Then the same four startups are gonna be part of a panel discussion. The topic for the panel is going to be startup and corporate partnerships and co collaborations. And the goal there is to share lessons learned, lessons learned and best practices. We're gonna repeat that same format with the second batch of startups and those are Vecna Robotics, Everactive, Profit Isle and Real-Time Robotics. We aim to wrap up around 12.35 p.m. Eastern time. In terms of audience interaction, there are a couple of ways for you to engage. So number one is uh, the Q&A feature. And so this, this is where you can ask questions to startups that relate to their presentations, or you can ask questions uh, to the panel. Make sure you enter those questions as soon as you think about them, and then upvote the good ones. We're gonna do the best to get to as many of these questions as we can, starting at the top. So the questions with the most uh, votes, we're likely not gonna get to all the questions. So there's also the chat feature, so this is where you can follow up with additional questions that you have or questions that are unanswered. And we're asking the startups to monitor the chat and answer using the chat. So you can think of this as a little bit of a Twitter feed within Zoom. Finally, there is a request on Interpol. So you select the startups you want to meet and your ILP contact will connect you after the event. And then finally, before we start, I wanna spend a minute on what I call Mindset Minute. This is a very fast paced event and we'll actually not cover anything in depth. Rather, the objective here is to be the spark for the beginning of a conversation and the beginning of a partnership. If you have any comments, feedback, or wanna engage generally, my email is marcusd at mit.edu. And so with that, we're gonna to go to our first presenter it's Abhijit Ghosh from Akasha Imaging. He's the VP of Engineering there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Um, I'm Abhijit Ghosh, as Marcus said, I'm the VP of Engineering at Akasha Imaging. We are an imaging and artificial intelligence company targeting manufacturing automation and inspection. Our connection to MIT is through Achyuta Kadambi and Ramesh Raskar, who both hail from the MIT Media Labs. Let's see. 
Um, so let's talk about the problem with manufacturing automation. Only about 15% of industrial robots in vision system, uh, use vision systems today. And why is that? Why is that number so low? Why are most of these robots using uh, fixtures? And that is because manufacturing is filled with optically challenging objects, things like shiny metals, black rubber, uh, transparent materials such as glass or plastic. Traditional or current uh, op uh, vision systems struggle with such optically challenging objects. Also, when the lighting conditions change, which happens often on factory floors, these systems often need expensive uh, recalibration uh, and downtime, which brings the line down. Some of these systems also use very expensive hardware, lasers, uh, uh, compli complicated lenses that increase their costs. This all leads to long sales cycles, slow time to adoption, and often frustrated customers. We are using a new uh, modality of light. We're using the physics of light. We're using multi-view geometry. We're using spectral imaging. And we're also using deep learning to create a system that is much more robust. I'll give you an example here. Um, on the left side of the screen where my cursor is, you see a styrofoam cup scanned with existing technology. As you can see, the depth is very coarse. We can refine that depth to the depth uh, to a depth map that is seen on the right side, where you can see the high spatial as well as depth resolution. This is done by passively taking a few pictures from, from of the cup and constructing a dense surface normal map of the object being imaged. Um, this technology is robust to different kinds of materials. We can handle shiny metals, black rubber, uh, transparent objects, glass or plastic. We're robust to lighting changes uh, because we're just using the physics of light. And we use custom off-the-shelf components. Uh, therefore, our hardware cost is actually significantly lower than existing solutions. I'll give you a demonstration of this uh, technology with this robotic bin picking system. We are here we are picking an optically challenging object, which is transparent balls. Uh, where my cursor is, is our camera system, looking down at the bin of transparent objects here. And you see the robot picking the, picking the objects. What I want to draw your attention to is on the bottom left corner, uh, bottom corner, bottom side of the, of the screen, where I show you the results of segmentation uh, of both the Akasha imaging system and a conventional imaging system. Uh, I've paused the video here. You can see that the plastic balls are very clearly segmented in the Akasha imaging solution. While in the conventional imaging solution, you can see how segmentation is very bad. It bleeds all over and the, and the boundaries are not clear. If the boundaries are not clear, you cannot locate the object in space in 3D and therefore you will not be able to pick it up. Um, Let's see. Uh, here is another example of uh, our technology in action. Here is a black rubber, another optically challenging material, which has a hairline crack in it. Now, if we zoom into the area of the hairline crack where my cursor is, you cannot see the crack in an RGB image. This color image is a color-coded surface normal image uh, of the same tire, where the surface normal, that's the direction in which the surface normal points is color-coded. And in that color-coded surface normal image, you can easily see the crack because the crack leads to a change in the surface normal. So today, these defects are also not visible to the human eye. Inspectors, manual inspectors, use their fingers to, and touch to basically identify these defects. We can identify these defects uh, using vision systems. We are going to be in pilot deployment uh, in early 2021 with our robot agnostic perception platform. We are working with a tier one automotive manufacturer right now. We're calling automotive manufacturers, plastic and rubber manufacturers and electronics manufacturers for applications such as pick and place, end of line inspection, sorting, welding, machine tending, uh, and that's it. Thanks, Abhijit. So um, a couple of questions for you from the audience. So um, the question is, what type of imaging sensor do you use? Is this RGBD, is this required? I.e., can you use laser scan stereo camera? So we do not use laser scan. We use uh, our RGB sensors. Uh, the depth is something that we infer from our processing. Uh, so we use uh, sensors that are used for cell phone cameras. Um, Got it. Next question. How long does it take to process an image? 
Uh, typically, we can go uh, as, as high as 30 frames per second, but for most industrial applications, uh, cycle times are in the order of 500 to 200 to 500 milliseconds. Can, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the underlying software technology? Um, so the underlying software technology is, um, uh, is a combination of uh, imaging techniques, physics of light, deep learning, uh, spectral imaging, and multi-view geometry. Um, they come together in very interesting ways, and that's basically our competitive differentiation in how we use these technologies. Unfortunately, I don't think we have enough time uh, to uh, go into the details of the underlying software. Right, and I think actually at this point, we're gonna to have to go to the next speaker. There are many great questions here. So I'm gonna encourage everyone to try to move that over to the chat discussion. And then we're gonna to go, to, go to our next speaker, Andy Wong, founder and CEO of Prescient Devices. Okay, great. Uh, my name's Andy Wong. I'm the CEO of Prescient Devices. Uh, we actually have quite a number of MIT alums as well as MIT professors involved um, as, in the founding team. So what we do is we provide a IoT uh, development platform uh, for enterprises. Uh, increasingly, enterprises are hiring engineers and data scientists today in-house to integrate IoT and AI with core products and core processes. Uh, this is the only way to build unique competitive advantages on those products and processes. Um, but the problem is that as most of you know, IoT technology infrastructure is quite complex, going from the sensors to embedded uh, systems, to security, to communication, et cetera. And this slows down the adoption uh, in enterprises. So we provide a, a technology platform that enables enterprise uh, engineers and data scientists to develop IoT applications without worrying about, worrying about the underlying technology infrastructure. So the way we do that is, is virtualizing the entire um, technology infrastructure behind a design automation software. Uh, this design automation software is the first of its kind in the industry to allow users to uh, implement the entire IoT system in the same design. This means you can directly uh, program your edge devices, your cloud functionalities. You can connect any device to any other device. And uh, this not only simplifies the design process, but it actually enables um, users to develop very powerful applications, which is the end goal. So ultimately users are able to focus on extracting value out of the data, which is the value for enterprises, rather than spending most of their time on maintaining the technology infrastructure uh, behind the, the application. Uh, one of the major uses for the technology is building digital twin systems. Uh, a digital twin is a digital representation of, um, um, of a product or process. And you can use that digital information to monitor, predict, um, and eventually improve your product or process. Uh, this is gonna become a core competency for most enterprises going forward. And we enable the continuous development and integration of such digital twin systems in-house. So currently our V1.0 product is released. Uh, we're looking for customers and pilots. We encourage you to try our software to see how much easier and how much faster it makes your team to work with IoT. We also have a lot of very good information in our blog because we have seen a lot of um, adoption cases. So I would encourage you to read those as well. Um, so for any information, uh, please contact me at my email, which is down here. Thank you. We have a question for you. What technology experts should enterprises hire in-house to advance the IoT adoption? Um, so, so what we've seen is that uh, a lot of enterprises are hiring data scientists. This is because data is the most uh, uh, important uh, asset. Uh, rather the value behind the data. Therefore, um, hiring data scientists give enterprises the biggest value. But the problem is that data scientists and even IT engineers have trouble uh, managing that entire IoT technology infrastructure. You need that in order to get the data. So we manage that part, we enable the IT engineers and, and data scientists 
to work on the valuable and the unique part uh, for the enterprises. Great. And is your platform solely a software as a service solution? Can you talk a little more to that? That's a great question. So we actually um, have a lot of experience uh, supporting the entire solutions. Uh, we have built a previous startup that has deployed over half a million um, devices and we built everything from the hardware all the way to the cloud. So the way we see it is that um, a lot of enterprises need help with getting the sensors, getting the data acquisition, um, getting a lot of the things set up and we would help them. And of course, over time, this would become sort of a standard set of systems, right? Um, and, um, and so that enterprise will just, just focus on the data part um, while we would be able to take care of everything else for them. Great, thank you. Thank you. So um, my name is Boaz Efroni. I'm the uh, VP of Product uh, Management and Business Development at Lightelligence, where uh, we are here to reinvent computing for AI using integrated photonic. Uh, our founding team are all MIT al alumni, including uh, uh, one professor still uh, uh, within the company. So um, one of the things that happens is that the number of applications for AI that uses machine learning and AI are growing strikingly every, every year. The problem with that, they, they need to run on hardware. That hardware is what is known as AI inference or AI training hardware. Uh, that hardware is usually electronics and that hardware takes about three to four years to get to the next generation, smaller, faster. Uh, the AI market today with application and data is actually growing, doubling every year. So that puts a problem for the uh, enterprises. They need to stock up more and more server. There's a problem in space, system cost, and electricity cost. Now, if we look at the uh, uh, what hardware is running today, the AI inference and training, you see uh, anywhere from CPU for flexibility through GPU, FPGAs, and ASICs. We want to change that. We want to enable to jump, leapfrog the ability and the limitations of the geometry and the clock speed by providing a new uh, photonic ASIC. It's an integrated photonic machine, uh, a, basically a chip integrated uh, that provides a leapfrog and fundamental leapfrog over everything out there. Now, what you can do with that uh, the throughput is now becoming 20 to 30x what is electronics provide for the same uh, area. Uh, there's no heat dissipation from the uh, matrix multiplication that's done in photonic, enabling us to uh, very uh, use uh, very sophisticated 3G packaging that is very hard to do with electronics due to heat dissipation on the other side. And of course, speed of light. So we're looking at a very, very low latency. These are the three major uh, contributor for the success of our technology. And uh, uh, what to, we want to do for the go-to-market is to make sure it's easy for you, our customers, to integrate our hardware into new hardware into your uh, servers. So we're going to build a PCI card. It's a drop-in replacement PCI card. Uh, the form in the, uh, the card is like a GPU or an FPGA that you see out there that you already buy out there today to your systems. And we'll provide all the software tools to take the output from your training and compile it, quantize it, and run it on our system. So you'll have a huge advantage. Now let's look at an example of a problem where such thing occurs. Uh, if you look at an enterprise, you're limited with uh, latency that limits your ability to run very sophisticated algorithms. Um, the, uh, the space is growing dramatically because you had to add more and more servers to comply with your uh, uh, customer base uh, increasing. And the system cost is, of course, uh, growing high. Uh, what we will provide, of course, is uh, improve by 20x in latency, uh, 20x, 12x less space, and 10x less system cost. All of that, uh, basically 12 to 1 ability to provide you with a much, much better solution, condensed and running. So what we're looking for basically is a company that has what is known as on-prem servers. So servers that you have on your on-premises, we're already talking to the cloud uh, providers, but we're looking for companies that have on-prem servers that would like to continue and improve. Um, so let's talk if you have on-prem and you like to uh, evaluate us and, and work with us. We're looking for companies in enterprise and data centers, video surveillance and analytics, finance, 5G, high-performance computing, medical, auto, uh, auto, autonomous uh, transport vehicle, industrial inspection, 
and robotics. Uh, my email is here and you can contact me through MIT. I'll be more than happy to uh, answer questions and follow up with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boaz. We'll do a couple of audience questions. Do you plan an edge computing device? That's a good question. So we're focusing, our, our solution is very high throughput. Uh, and it's a little, it's a, it's a high, it's a higher power state than what's uh, usually used inside edge devices. So the answer is no. Uh, we're looking more into uh, either cloud enterprise servers or, or what is known as edge servers. So anywhere that the PCA card is used today, it's the right place for us to go. Great. And um, can you talk a little more of why um, photonics is coming back now, even though it's been around since the 60s? Sure, that's a great question. So in the 60s and 70s, uh, electronics and photonics were running uh, kind of uh, uh, one against the other to see who's going to make a better computer. The Van Neumann architecture turned out to uh, enable the electronics to squeeze much, much faster into uh, lower and lower geometry and squeeze more and more uh, things on it, made it a much more viable solution for that. Machine learning turn things around by making now the computation uh, uh, statistic and, and linear. Um, matrix multiplication is the big thing here. Additional thing that happened is that uh, in, in, pre in present years, there was a research that showed basically and testing that shows that for inference, for analytics, you can go lower resolution. So you can go integer eight instead of full ball blown floating point. Both of these together made photonic a very, very viable and uh, possibility for machine learning. And that's where we come in today. Great, thank you. Back to you, Marcus. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next speaker. And just again, a quick reminder to the startups, there are plenty of questions I'm seeing in the chat um, and plenty of unanswered questions in the Q&A. So let's uh, please go ahead and try to address those. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Tom Barron, co-founder and CEO of Lumi. Great. Th thanks so much. So thank, thank you so much uh, to Stex25 for having us. Um, I think one of the things that's really fantastic about a lot of the startups that you'll see in this year's class is uh, the number of folks who are working on innovating materials for packaging, uh, consumer packaged goods. And we're, we're another one of those companies doing that, but we're doing it in a little bit of a different way. So, so we are a, a, a packaging materials innovation company, but we're not selling any materials at all. What we sell is data that you put into a printing press and if you put that data into a printing press, it makes inexpensive materials look like very, very expensive materials, uh, just using the data that we provide. So our, our vision really is to transform this giant you know, global printing industry, and that's the name of the game. We're saying, okay, well, what can we do by putting different data using software that we're providing into printing presses, taking standard materials that you use every day, and making them look like a brand new type of experience um, on, the, on the shelf. So as a lot of people know, in, you know, the name of the game in package printing really is shelf appeal, right? So if you're able to get a customer uh, or a consumer to take a product off the shelf and hold it into their hand, they're something like 80% more likely to actually put it into their basket. Um, and sort of tried and true method for doing this is to make the package look shiny and look really cool. You know, so things like metallics, holographic foils, like you'd see on you know, toothpaste boxes, and sometimes lenticular. The challenge with all of these is that they're very uh, difficult to integrate. They're less sustainable because you're making a, a laminate of dissimilar materials. They're less robust. They can flake off in shipment and they're expensive, not only in terms of the material cost, but in terms of the time that it might take to slow down the assembly line to integrate these materials. So we have a digital enhancement solution that um, creates this category of effects and a new category of effects as well without any new materials and no new equipment. So it's dramatically less expensive than using standard materials for packaging embellishment. You can save hundreds of thousands of dollars on a run, um, more sustainable, more elegant, and for a variety of reasons that I can get into, it's more secure than existing um, packaging solutions, and in fact, can be a standalone authentication solution for your products. So just some quick examples that you should see on the screen here of, of some effects that we can get. These are two um, labels on beer cans, but of course, it'll work on any type of package, but it's two very broadly used types of substrates. One is pressure sensitive materials on the left, and the, on the right is a shrink sleeve. What you're looking at is a clear label that started off clear and it's being printed on both sides of the label with standard black ink. Um, the secret sauce is the algorithms that we have that come up with where that ink has to go. And to give a, a sense of why this is a difficult technical problem, um, it's about a factor of a thousand times harder than preparing a standard printing plate 
But of course, once you prepare that plate, you can produce you know, literally miles and miles of these kinds of things. Um, okay, so just a few other quick examples to go through. So the first one uh, or two here are in the security space, authentication. So you can see we can produce for um, authentication products of a very broad depth, deep depth on, on thin substrates, also having different types of materials in the package or in the label substrate all at once. This is something that we did for a local brewery. You can see the motion in those little triangles at the bottom. What's notable about this is this was on a run where there was a job right before it, a job right after it, and we had to make our stuff work in a very, very constrained time slot, no change in the material at all, zero increased cost from a materials perspective, and they were able to get these effects on a shrink sleeve. So um, yeah, so we, we've gotten a lot of interest from a lot of different folks. We've actually a lot of people in the, in the beer space um, and you know, on the left is, is a company that we recently just completed a run for. We went from initial art exchange to labels on the can within four weeks, which is really fast. Um, we're uh, eager to explore uh, relationships with CPG brands as well as print producers um, to, uh, to, to, to move quickly. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess at that point, I'll turn it over for Q&A. So can you tell us a little bit about how your strategy is changing now that a lot of the shopping is in person or at stores? Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. So one of the things that we found actually, especially in the world of COVID, is that um, most of our direct customers who are the print production houses um, are tremendously busy. So um, because there are more people who are buying things in stores, um, that, that shelf experience is, uh, is, 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 is critical. It's all about building a better billboard for your product on the shelf. Um, so it, it's only enhanced things. Great. And you've talked a lot about, um, you know, we've seen some cool things about uh, beer cans, but what other market verticals could this be used for? Yeah, so that, that's a fantastic question. So, um, you know, one of the reasons that we're showing the beer cans is that, um, you know, although it's one particular market vertical, the labeling technology that you use on a beer can, for example, with a shrink sleeve, applies broadly across any packaging, you know, uh, vertical that you might imagine. So we've talked with different CPG companies who have told us, that for every one of their brands in their portfolio, there's at least one product, and sometimes the majority of products that use shrink sleeves. So that's a 360 degree wrap around any kind of product from a toothpaste tube uh, to a, uh, you know, a, a household cleaner to uh, you know, shampoo, anything, uh, pretty broad range. 